Hello, this is Bonnie Watkins, producer of Unfinished Business, Future of the American Women's Movement. This is a special excerpt about ending violence against women. We'll be interviewing three wonderful leaders. Kali Vang Her, director of New Cha, Hmong Women Achieving Together. Sasha Cotton from the Institute for Domestic Violence in the African American Community and Guadalupe Lopez of the Minnesota Indian Women Sexual Assault Coalition. Before the interview, we need to be clear about a couple of things. Domestic violence, like all forms of violence against women and children, is common in every community, including the white or mainstream culture. And violence is a cultural problem, not a problem of an individual woman or family. I would like any of you to jump in and comment on the, you know, the mainstream community, which almost is not a community, but, yeah. um, you know, how much of the work that you do and that the rest of us should be doing is within a racial cultural group, maybe an age group, and how much of it needs. And I was just thinking as you were asking that question that though I started off saying, well, we're very diverse and that our issues are different. I also feel like there are some very common mm -hmm. things that we can all work towards and that I think that that's the problem is when we see things happen domestic violence within minority communities, that it's almost um, the communities themselves are singled out as if this is just an issue within our own communities. And and I feel like when domestic violence happens in the broader community, in the white community, that we don't, it, it's not framed in the same way. And I almost feel like, like the way media works and the way uh, we've been all sort of institutionalized is that we, we, we're looking not as ourselves as working as groups together, but almost like saying, um, sort of dividing all of us. And I know that happens with racial issues, that happens with so many other things, but I, I feel like um, that, you know, there's so much work that could be done together, even though we are very diverse. And uh, I know you had mentioned that it would be really great if there was the ability to be able to um, find common themes that, mm -hmm. even though we're very different, that we can all work towards together and make it a movement of, of all people, not mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. groups doing things that just, you know, are trying to fix whatever is happening within their own community. But to not feel like we're being blamed when we see certain things happen, I understand that domestic violence happens in every community. Well, and I think that that's such an important note mm -hmm. because it is really one of those things that we know crosses all communities, it impacts all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. So I think when we talk about the issue, it's important to think about the response being different, but not mm -hmm. necessarily the action, right? So we know that the way that, um, the African American community, the Native community, the Asian community, mm -hmm. and broad communities, whether it be socioeconomic or mm -hmm. religious, th their response to services will be different, but yeah. their need for safety, their need mm -hmm. for education, their need for awareness, it's just the vehicle is culture, but the message still needs to be that violence is unacceptable and that it's not a core foundation of who we are as people, regardless mm -hmm. of you know like our affiliation to culture or race. So I think mm -hmm. trying to find those things that um, connect us and make us feel bonded to one another because there are these social constructions mm -hmm. is an important element, right? It may actually help to link us, but remembering that at the end of the day, it really is about um, getting at the heart of violence prevention mm -hmm. and that we all want to be safe. I asked the women, what strategies are you using to end violence? Vision statement from Hmong Women Achieving Together, which was preventing violence against Hmong women and girls by ending sexism in the community. And even within our own groups, there's great diversity. But within the Hmong community, we have women who are first generation. We've had so many different waves come to the United States that those of us who came earlier have a very different lens and a different mindset than those who came later. So. I, so I can only speak specifically to the Hmong community, but we know through research and through the work that we've done is that the domestic violence we see generally is uh, stems from our patriarchal uh, culture and the um, unequal treatment of uh, women, so gender issues within our communities also. You mentioned the Family Dialogue yes. Project, right? Do you want to say just a little more about what that is? Yeah, uh, the Family Dialogue Project is a really neat project, and what we do is we really believe that change happens within our families and our clans. and so. Uh, our goal with the Family Dialogues is to bring uh, families together, talk about uh, gender issues. I think that there, we can all be from the same family, and yet you know, one, one of our participants, um, a brother and a sister came together, and the brother walked away saying that, I didn't realize all of the things that you were challenged with being in this family. Mm -hmm. And to really help them uh, you know, see each other's roles and how different it is, and that you know, we, we can be in the same family and see the family so very differently. And so, um, so the Family Dialogues really addresses um, you know, gender issues within families and to really bring entire families to have those discussions.
So that's right at the button. kitchen table. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Sasha, what do we need to do moving forward to really end violence? What's the prevention mm -hmm. and elimination? Um, I think that part of what we do at IDVAC and part of what my work has been throughout the time that I've been doing domestic violence work and work with families is to really look at um, how the issue of domestic violence and violence in general is um, fueled by systems and looking at um, the way that communities interact with systems and this issue of historical racism, historical trauma that a lot of communities of color and African American families face and how that later on top of how we interact with systems is really impacting our feelings about violence, the normalcy of violence, really getting back to a place where violence offends us, mm -hmm. where we don't want violence in our communities and it's not something that we just accept, that we don't just take it, but that we really feel like a revolt has to happen to say like action is needed immediately, action was needed a long time ago, and not just services, but real action to say this is unacceptable, um, we want our children to be safe, we want women to be safe. So I think around prevention strategies, one of the things that we're doing right now at IDVAC, um, the Institute of Domestic Violence in the African American Community, is that we're pulling together our national partners and creating a project called the African American Domestic Peace Project, which really focuses on trying to raise public awareness about sort of this pandemic experience that African Americans are having with domestic violence and have over just generations really, um, along with the broader community, but specifically because our focuses on the African American community, looking at the ways that domestic violence plays out in our community and the needs that our community has that are different, um, but also prevention strategies. How do we talk about this? And then how do we talk about whole families? I think that that dynamic has gotten lost in the conversation and for communities, in particular communities of color, trying to figure out what women's needs are and what they really want. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes that challenges the systems we have created, that it may not be an escape route. It may be helpful, help planning how to stay in the relationship and be safe. Mm -hmm. So how do we talk about what are all the options for women and um, for families in general? That's great. So a lot of it's really about the communications Absolutely. As well as the, you know, how do we, how do we talk about things? Talking with Lupe Rodriguez, we especially enjoyed the vision statement from the Indian Women's Sexual Assault Network, creating safety and justice through the teachings of our grandmothers. We're trying, how we're trying to identify and bring up those dialogues in our community is um, understanding what that historical trauma has and um, has done to us as a people and what systems are still in place to keep that um, oppression so heavy on our backs. And I think a piece of it um, is that dialogue within different generations. Um, one of the unique things about the tribal communities is that we have, we know exactly when that oppression and that violence started for us in a different manner. And we can actually pinpoint that time for us unlike some mm -hmm. other um, you know, nations can, mm -hmm. and so how do we how do we reclaim that where women were held sacred, and men and women had their roles in certain, and violence was not accepted in our communities, um, and we understood that we have a clan system just like the mm -hmm. Hmong nations, and mm -hmm. and how important we had to live with each other, and how do we reclaim that back into you know or, and live that way in 2013, mm -hmm. and how do we raise it with all the social media and all the other influences of that um, help create that um, environment of violence. And so it's, it's like, it, it's trying to wake up our people and to say that we were sleeping. Mm -hmm. You know, you were, you were born into this society where things were so muddled with violence and um, acceptance of, of it and trying to wake people up and your, and your you know, relatives up to say, it's time to wake up. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. So, and Great. and we need lots of people to do yeah, it. The business about connecting to me is also about every woman who's been raped or beaten or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. any of the bad things mm -hmm. that have happened feels so alone. Mm -hmm. yes. That having a sense that you're not alone, whether yeah. it's any, any kind right. of community, yeah. is something that makes you feel better. What uh, Guadalupe maybe say more, too, about that we haven't talked as much about rape and sexual assault as, as DV, mm -hmm. but um, I think also the focus on like younger college age and high school age women and the, you know, I do think there's still that kind of cultural assumption out there that stranger rape, you know, right. somebody's mm -hmm. gonna jump out from behind the tree She's, on the dark street, mm -hmm. whatever. But the teen, teen dating violence yeah. really has components mm -hmm. of both sexual assault, just plain battering. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, we can, um, was it two, uh, two years ago, we, our report release of the Garden of Truth, um, we did a, um, and I hate to say 
a research project because this was our people, this was our relatives that we, we spoke with. So um, we asked them about their experiences and their survival skills that they used when they were being used in prostitution and trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, and then just understanding the dynamics of how that works in tribal communities and, and understanding that we are a unique uh, group of people who have not just one um, entity of government, it's, it could be three layers of government over them. So, and how do we um, educate and make make those change makers in our community? How do we do that? Um, and make space for healing, make space for change, make space for accountability. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if we look back at some of the ways that it, um, prevention has been, or not prevention, but how it's been done in the past, it's like, oh, teach the girls how to be safe, mm -hmm. teach the girls mm -hmm. what not to do, teach the girls. It's not working. Right. Years and years and years and years and thousands of years of sexual violence has been happening. Mm -hmm. And it's just been a form mm -hmm. of like, well, that's, you know, it goes into that sexism. It just bleeds in there and you don't mm -hmm. even know that it's in there. Mm -hmm. So um, what the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition is trying to do is what are we gonna have our men do? Mm -hmm. You know, not every man is out there raping, right. but they have to start holding each other in their own gender accountable for these that's assaults. So and so what does that look like? And, and where, if we think about the oppression that women are born into, they have a different kind of um, an experience on what their identity is as um, men of color mm -hmm. and what's been taken away because of that racism mm -hmm. and those systems that are set in place. So they need to start having those dialogues. Mm -hmm. And because we, if we try to do it alone, it's like, pulling a wagon and only one side's working and the other side's just yes. being dragged. Right, just being you dragged know. along. Exactly, mm -hmm. we're never gonna get anywhere. So it's, it's having that dialogue with both genders and all youth, elders, and all ages in between. Can, yeah. I would, can I just add real quick though that, and I know that we've, we've all sort of talk, touched a little bit about patriarchy within our own, um, you know, own communities, but I, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding in that the American culture itself is extremely patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes there's a misperception and so people look at that and they say, well, why are Hmong men so oppressive to Hmong women? Why, you know, why are Indian men you know, not holding other Indian men accountable? And that's not true because we are, we are a small cosmos of what's happening in the greater culture and that if we look at, um, you know, there are measurements of patriarchy within cultures and America is actually extremely patriarchal compared yeah. to other you know, Scandinavian countries or you know, they, they only rank a little bit higher than you know, Middle Eastern countries. So, and so there's all this ranking. So I don't want anybody to be disillusioned by the fact that, mm -hmm. that we're talking about what's happening in oppression within our own uh, cultures, but that it, it is a part of a larger issue and that I would never want anyone to look at um, these men from these specific communities and say it's an issue with those men, because it's an issue with yeah. men in the larger community yeah. too. Well, and it's an issue with communities in general, right? Yeah. That as we've been trying to really get to this point of these issues affect everyone. And yes. the only thing that we can give testimony to is the way that our work is impacting the community that we work Absolutely. in, which is just a small part of our yes. cultural communities, right? That our cultural communities Absolutely. are national and sometimes international. And so it's yeah. important to, to highlight the fact that yeah. I think all of us are doing good work to try to get at the issues, but that yes. we don't have all the answers either. And so it's yeah. like, we're just trying to see what might have a, an mm -hmm. impact, what might actually work. But to this point about the teen dating violence and college mm -hmm. campus piece, as I was listening to you talk, Guadalupe, I was thinking about some work that's happening um, within the historical black colleges and this idea of making sure that young men understand what consent mm -hmm. is, right? Yes. And I think that that's important across college campuses mm -hmm. everywhere because I don't think that we spend a lot of time talking to our sons about mm -hmm. don't be a rapist. Don't be in a, a batterer, right? Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time talking to our daughters about don't be a victim, blotting your blouse up, don't walk by yourself in the dark, mm -hmm. don't have too many drinks at a party. But we don't talk to our boys about don't take advantage of a girl if she's passed out. Mm -hmm. Don't coerce her. If she says no, it doesn't mean keep asking. It means don't ask anymore and respect mm -hmm. the boundaries, right? Don't flip skirts up at you know parties, right? Like, how do we talk to, don't yes. beat up your girlfriend. It's not okay yeah. that if she makes you mad to shake her a little bit, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I feel like these yeah. are messages that we think, of course they should just know that, yeah. but they don't. So yeah. do, you know, who's telling them this is unacceptable behavior, right? Mm -hmm. um, just because you're not like beating her up along the concrete you know, sidewalk, it doesn't mean that you're not being abusive. And so mm -hmm. how do we get them to a place where they understand healthy relationships? And I think that that's the focus of prevention is really teaching people how to interact in a healthy way. Yes. Which is a long, big job though. Yeah, it's hard, <laughs> it's really hard. And I'm not one of those who wants to only start in kindergarten. You Me know, either. Like, I was, uh, one of your websites, I think it was Music, had the business about elder abuse specifically mm -hmm. too, yeah, that the, you important. know, there's 
80 year old women mm-hmm. being raped and yeah. beaten and having all yes. their money stolen. I mean, to me, it's really all part of that yeah, same. Absolutely. And there is, there really is that perspective that we've all been hurt by yeah. patriarchy, including men. Mm-hmm. Yes. And absolutely. there's there's some truth in the fact that if you've been hurt, you're more likely to hurt somebody else. Mm-hmm. That hurt people hurt Not people. that it's an excuse, no. but again, we have to understand the depth of yeah. that hurt, that the, all the power struggles and the economic inequality in addition to the yeah. blatant violence that's right. out there. Doesn't, yeah. You can't just transcend that. Yeah. You have to have yeah. time in your life and a mentor and a teacher mm-hmm. and some support to understand how that all works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's the the layer where culture becomes really important and becomes a resource and becomes a, you know, like a challenge as well, Mm -hmm. right, is that, um, you know, we're living in America, most of us, communities of color, lots of us have been here for generations upon generations, Mm -hmm. but we still have this cultural aspect that leaves us on the outside, that leaves us in a place where we feel oppressed, where we don't feel a part of. Mm -hmm. And so that's just another layer of oppression that adds to our angst in this country Mm -hmm. and that may add to the agitation of why there's division in our communities, why there's a heightened sense of violence in some of our communities, right? It's, It's not an innate right of communities of color to be violent any more than it is anybody yes. else's. But there's these systems in place that create um, environments that are hostile. And when there's mm-hmm. a hostile environment, bad things happen. Mm-hmm. And so we're being treated a lot of the times as hostile participants in, in our society um, by mainstream, I think, and that that does leave us in a particularly vulnerable place for violence. Mm-hmm. And don't you think there's still just so much denial, too? Absolutely. But if I'm a woman who's been beaten or raped, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there is still a shame. There oh, is still absolutely. a... Uh, scared. There's still a, I feel like especially younger women are really taught so much better than I was to be confident, to be yes. poised, to do that job mm-hmm. interview as if you're just on top mm-hmm. of the world. But, you know, not many women's lives are quite as shiny and perfect <laughs> as as we are taught to present, present them. So I don't know, I feel like we still need to just make it safe for women yeah. to talk to anybody, to each other, to their moms, to their yeah. daughters. Absolutely. I don't know. We have some of the best conversations and some of the best um, strategic planning around that kitchen table that you were talking yes. about you know Absolutely. and that's how the you know this movement started yeah. and i think that um gotta just bring it up a little bit a notch and now say oh well, yeah what else is what else can yeah. be done and then let's talk all the way to the end of the block right. <laughs> the, two right. stuff. Yeah. the um now mm-hmm. i believe the family dialogue project mm-hmm. from Nucha was you're kind of um training women and giving them the template mm-hmm. for how to go have that conversation yeah. right well we do that we do some of that work in our leadership institute but in the um the intergenerational retreats that we do and the family dialogues is really um uh, is really communication within family. So we, we're, we're so we're teaching the family how to have that kind of communication, and that they, we would like to see them take that and implement it to the larger, mm-hmm. the larger family, the larger clan system. And such a huge impact. When I, you know, 20 years ago, I don't think that I would ever have seen Hmong men standing up and saying, "I have male privilege. I, you know, I have, um, you know, uh, these other privileges that that women don't have." Mm-hmm. And now we have Hmong men standing up saying, "We have to stop this. We have we have all this privilege, and we have the power to do something." And we truly I truly believe that it is because somebody was having these dialogues with these young men when they were young so that they could grow up to have a different lens. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. Right. When, I, when I first heard about that, absolutely. I thought that the white women need this, everybody yeah. needs this. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. I think there's lots of women who would go home and talk with yes. their families, but kind of don't know where to start. And should there be coffee? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Donuts. Donuts. So your yeah. um, kitchen table dialogues, do you want to say more about how those work? Well, we, we understood that. Uh, are in our communities that that violence is so kept a secret and it, mm-hmm. it because of so many reasons and layers of oppression and mm-hmm. fear and whatnot so we but we also know that in each community there's always one really great organizer mm-hmm. one that just everyone goes to and we wanted to find that person in mm-hmm. the community and mm-hmm. have them open their house they are they're already taking the people anyways to you know get help and resources and do it on their own mm-hmm. and they're from their own heart and so how do we find those true leaders that are already born in our community and and enhance that oh, okay. and so we have multiple leaders in every little you know in every neighborhood in every tribe and every reservation and every you know everywhere Mm -hmm. and um, gaining that leadership skills within so because everybody has a gift and that's how we're going to do it is if we enhance our gifts and recognize the gifts we bring that we are born with and bring it to the table to help end it because we're not all going to be the ones that are going to be good at policy or the ones that are good with um, you know making law we're going to be the ones that are the helpers of different Mm -hmm. things and so to recognize that and putting everybody's you know gifts in place great Sasha does 
you had a good way to pronounce the name of yeah. IDVAC. IDVAC. Does IDVAC do anything that's that that kind of really grassroots dialogue kind of resource? Um, so IDVAC is a national TA provider, and so our primary um, role is really providing technical assistance and guidance to programs nationally. And so um, I spoke about our African American Domestic Peace Project before, and we have. Um, I think 12 sites right now nationally across the country who are really convening and um, we've been really trying to use technology as a means because our community is structured differently um, than both the Hmong community and the Native American community in that um, we're far more spread out, our communities um, have been indoctrinated sort of into mainstream culture in a way that is different. We've lost a lot of the times our language, some of our cultural lens because mm -hmm. of slavery, and then we have new incoming African immigrants, Afro Latinos, Afro Caribbean. So trying to figure out the d diversity and complexity that yeah, exists in our own complex. community, mm -hmm. that it's not as um, cut and dry as sometimes it appears. You know that like oh all black people are in poverty and poor. Right? We have mm -hmm. highly educated African Americans and middle class middle African Americans and low. You know so there's just this wide range of how do we reach out to them. So social mm -hmm. media and the internet is one of the venues that we've been trying to utilize as well as African-American churches and mosques. Mm -hmm. And so we've been convening these African-American Domestic Peace Project participants and filming video blogs that are going to be loaded to our website. And so part of what that process mm -hmm. will do is to give a vantage point on nationally the similarities that exist between the East Coast, the Midwest, the West Coast, the South, but also the differences, right? And we're hoping that we can use that as a tool to be able to teach other programs nationally and in those regions how to build these programs up. So we've picked programs that we know are doing great work in their communities and are trying to highlight the work that they're doing and how they're doing it and hold them up as national um, role models. Wonderful. Our time is almost up. By the way, I'm going to put all your websites up so people can come and find out more because you all have so many wonderful resources that I think really could apply so many places. Quick last question. How hopeful are you? Are we going to really put an end to this stuff? I feel really hopeful from the signs that I've seen in, in the work that we've been doing in the Hmong community. I feel like we're at the cusp of a, a, a new wave of really how we're going to address you know, what's happening, domestic violence within our own communities. And I'm extremely hopeful. And I see all of these young people stepping up saying, I want to be part of the solution. And that gives me so much hope. So I, yeah, I'm very hopeful. Thank you. I need that. <laughs> Sasha? I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not quite as hopeful. But I mean, I am, I'm very hopeful. Yeah. Um, I have, haven't been in the movement for that long, so maybe, I don't know, seven years or something that I've been working specifically on domestic violence issues. And in that time, I've learned a ton, but I certainly feel like in each conversation I'm having with people, survivors are um, so resilient, you know what mm. I mean? That their ability to get back in it and really fight for access and rights for women is remarkable. And so I feel like as we churn out, hopefully people won't have to experience the violence to be able to be advocates and really fight for the rights of women. But I think we're churning out some really great leadership and that with that leadership, hopefully we'll make some real changes. Great. great, thank you. Guadalupe. I am hopeful because um, before everybody came here, we did have a peaceful place here. And now that everybody's living here, we can still retain that and that mm -hmm. that should be our goal mm -hmm. is if it wasn't really if violence against women and children um, weren't so predominant here then we can get that back so that's one piece and the other piece is that um, when we have want change from the people by the people how powerful that is mm -hmm. and so to recognize that um, we're we're building new leadership every day we're building new new change makers every day is really important. So I'm very Wonderful. hopeful. Wonderful. Well, you all have cheered me up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can even read the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. You're all really smart, and I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks, having Bonnie. us. Thanks, Bonnie. Let's review the strategies the women mentioned. Work across communities, engage whole families, recognize historical trauma, get back to a place where violence offends us, and not just services to women, but action for change. More strategies, raise public awareness, consider all options for women, dialogue within and among generations and genders, ask our families how they did it, and educate change makers. Don't just teach girls and women to be different. Men must hold each other accountable. Make sure young men understand consent. Teach healthy relationships. Make it safe for women to talk to each other and bring new leaders with diverse skills. Need more information? The Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition is at MUSAC, M-I-W-S-A-C dot org. MongWomenAchieve.org is also on Facebook. 
or the Institute on Domestic Violence is idvaac.org. There's many more organizations out there. Thanks for so much help. Mike Rosberg, Technical Director, Stephen, Faith, and Libby, Camera Operators, to SPNN for the use of its studios. This is an excerpt from a longer work still in progress. Please visit unfinishedbusinessusa.com for more information about that. Thank you.